so let's talk about different reflecting telescope designs. You have different designs for all sorts of different applications. This covers pretty much the spectrum of different designs. First is prime focus. And this is the simplest design. You have the light coming through, striking the primary mirror, going up to the principal prime focal position. And what you would do is you stick your detector there. It's not good for small telescopes because a detector, they can be quite small. And digital cameras are often, astronomical ones are this big. But if your telescope's only that big, your digital camera just blocked all the incoming light. And it's not a very practical thing. So if you have like a 10 meter diameter mirror and your detector is only a foot across, then it's not a big deal. You're blocking one square foot out of what might be like hundreds of square feet of collecting surface. That central part of your primary mirror won't receive light, but it's okay. So big telescopes prime focus uh, is often done. It has its advantages. You can get larger field of views and all sorts of different things by sticking your telescope, your, your camera up there. But a smaller telescope, it's no good. Often with the amateur market, you'll see Newtonian. You don't see Newtonian very much professionally, but you see it with amateur telescopes. They're quite small. You don't want to have the person's head blocking the incoming light. So we've already seen an example of this in the other figure. You put a secondary mirror in there. You have to have some kind of support to hold the secondary mirror. Just like with the prime focus, the camera doesn't float there magically. You have some support structure. And the support structure is blocking light a little bit. But as long as it doesn't block too much, it's not a problem. Same thing with secondary mirrors. As long as they're not too big and their support structure isn't too big, you don't block too much light. You can get most of the light still, and you send it off to the side. And maybe if it's an amateur telescope, you have an eyepiece there, or you have a camera. <coughs> See, Newtonian has its limit as your telescope gets bigger. If you have a small telescope sitting here, you stand, look through the Newtonian focus, Light's coming in, coming out, secondary into your eye, that's fine. But if you make it really big, you know, then the tube is really long, you might have to stand on a ladder to look through Newtonian focus. And the bigger you make it, the more cumbersome that becomes. So another design you sometimes see on small telescopes and also on professional telescopes is Cassegrain. If you have that secondary mirror there, it's blocking the center of the primary mirror. No light's going to be bouncing off the center of the primary mirror because you have the secondary in the way. So you might as well just cut a hole through there and have the, the secondary mirror point down. So the light comes, bounces off most of the primary, up hits the secondary and comes down through a hole in the primary. We call this Cassegrain. The prompt telescopes are Cassegrain. A lot of professional telescopes are. And even amateur telescopes, because sometimes it's difficult to get your head up to the Newtonian focus to look through. Instead, you can just bend down and look through the back of the telescope. It might make no sense. You have the primary mirror there, but inside you got a secondary and a hole through the primary. And so you can look there or attach your camera there. That's a nice, well balanced, that's another key thing, balance. Suppose you're not going to look with your eye, but you're going to stick a digital camera. That's on the main axis. That's a nice balanced place to stick it. Newtonian is off on the side. You stick your camera there. If your camera's heavy, your telescope's no longer well balanced and might be more difficult to move around. So Cassegrain's good for any size telescope from amateur up to professional. And it's a very well-balanced solution. So you see it a lot. And then you have this other category, Naismith Coude. Now, you only see this with large professional telescopes. The distinction is a little subtle between Naismith and Coude. Uh, let's just kind of group them together. But what if you have an instrument that is super heavy, too heavy to attach to the moving telescope? It would just make the telescope very difficult to move around in a reliable kind of way. And Coude in particular. Sometimes we have instruments that weigh tons and fill entire rooms. And it's rare, but some of the big telescopes have systems like that. Well, what you do is you stick a third mirror in there, and that third mirror points down, in the case of Coudet, points down the rotation axis of the telescope. The telescope's rotating on a particular axis. Maybe this is the axis, and the telescope's rotating around it. No matter where I move the telescope, I can use that third mirror my sound is bouncing off my arms and the microphone different ways. It's disorienting. But anyway, you can use that third mirror to send the light down that fixed rotation axis. You can send it right below the floor into a room, uh, one floor below, where you have a, a major instrumentation room. Naismith is kind of like that, except you're sending it off to the sides. It still kind of rides on the telescope. It's not a separate room, but it's for kind of in-between size instruments. 
You don't have to worry about the distinction between Naismith and Cudet. The point is, if your instrument is too big to strap on a Cassegrain or Prime or Newtonian, you can use these other designs. So let me show you an example. This is one of my favorite telescopes in the world. This is the Hale 200-inch. Uh, we'll use it in a number of examples. It's used in the homework. Hale 200-inch. 200 inches is 5 meters. Telescopes are named by the size of the primary mirror. So this was the largest telescope in the world for about 25 years, from mid-20th century until the late 70s or early 80s, when the largest telescope in the world became a 10 meter. But the bottom of the telescope here, you can't see the mirror, this is just a sketch. I'll show you the real one in a second. But here you go. The bottom, this is 200 inches across, you have one single mirror in there. So it works in all the different configurations. The light comes down, bounces off the primary. Imagine the tertiary not being in the way, and the secondary not being in the way. You can focus all the way back up here to prime focus. And back then, we didn't have digital cameras. If we did, we would just stick a digital camera there. Instead, we had these large pieces of glass made by Kodak. They're basically film, but on glass, that we call photographic plates. It required a human to be there to hold it in the slightly bent focal plane, pass it off to an assistant, put another one in. Very manual operation back in the mid-20th century. So a person would ride up there. This thing is like five stories tall or something like that. And all night you ride in the observer's cage, the bucket, it's sometimes called. Nowadays, nobody rides in it, but it would have been a very strange, disorienting job, particularly if you have a fear of heights. We still use prime focus. It's all digital now. And the observers go up once a night, uh, refresh the liquid nitrogen. You can stick another mirror here, a secondary mirror, sending the light back down through a hole in the primary, Cassegrain, so you can attach instruments to the back of the telescope. And here's a forklift to get you up to the back of the telescope to do that kind of work. It also has a tertiary. It can be used to send the light down the main axis to the room below, called the Coudet room. So that's an example of Coudet. You can turn the tertiary to the side, sending the light out into these two support arms. There's one here that's been drawn in cutaway, and there's one on the other side. And there's a lot of space in there, and you can stick medium-sized instrumentation in there. It's not riding on the telescope per se, but it's riding on the telescope support structure. I spent about three days in the, the left arm of the thing. It's really freaking cold in there. Uh, this is a Caltech telescope at Palomar Observatory, south of LA. Here it is in reality. Let's give you a sense of scale. Here are people down here at the bottom looking at it, the five-meter mirror. Cassegrain focus is under there. Here's the observer cage. Here's one of the arms. It's not in cutaway anymore because it's a real picture, but you have instruments here at Naismith. You have instruments below the floor at Cude. You have everything but Newtonian on this. And if you look up here, you can see the catwalk for getting to the observer's cage. To point the telescope straight up, what you do, and I did this because we had to change the liquid nitrogen after the run. Professional cameras are often cooled with liquid nitrogen. You get in a little elevator, and you start by standing on the floor, and it rides up the side, and then it's, by the time you get off, the wall is the floor, and the floor is the wall. And it's not enclosed or anything, it's a little box, and you just got to get used to it and hope you don't fall out. And then you get on the crosswalk there, and you walk over to the telescope, and you get above the observer's cage, and there's about a two and a half foot gap. The cage is this big. So you know, mentally you know, you could jump down in, but there's that two and a half gap and then if, if you like, jump like this or something, it's ten stories of nothingness until you hit the ground. So most of us, including myself, psychologically couldn't do it. I just went up to say that I'd been in the cage, I couldn't get into the cage. Uh, someone else changed what we to do. But uh, it's, it's a cool telescope. So there's one more type of telescope that we should consider, and that's a Schmidt telescope. And these have both mirrors, as a mirror, a primary mirror, and it also makes use of a lens uh, that's usually called a corrector plate. Corrector plate or corrector lens. We see it both on most amateur telescopes and some special purpose professional telescopes. Here's a common amateur telescope. This is one step up from what you get at Walmart or Kmart. This is from me. The Celestron also makes them. They're nice amateur telescopes, but this one here is probably a $5,000 toy. 
but you know, that's the amateur market. Professional telescopes like the Prompt telescopes cost about 100,000 a piece. Our SOAR telescope, which is four meters across, and I'll show that to you in a little while, in a couple of classes, that's $30 million. So there's a wide range of prices. Most expensive telescopes made so far about $100 million. But they're thinking of building 30 meter class telescopes next, and those will be even more expensive. Anyway, that's a tangent. Here, what we have is a Cassegrain arrangement. The light comes in the front, bounces off a mirror, comes up with a secondary mirror, and out through a hole at the back of the telescope where you can see an eyepiece attached at an angle. But if you notice the front of the telescope, there's a piece of glass there. And it's not just to keep water out of the tube, it's actually specially designed, uh, it's refracting the light as it comes in. And the reason for that is amateur telescopes tend to make use of spherical mirrors. And as we talked about before, parabolic is the ideal shape for a mirror. Here's a parabola. Now when we build the mirror, we don't build the whole parabola. We usually build just this piece down here at the bottom. But parabolic mirrors are expensive to make because the radius of curvature is always changing. You've got a lot of curvature down here, not as much curvature as you go off on the main axis of the parabola. So it's a different manufacturing process. It's a little bit more expensive. The amateur market makes use of the fact that the bottom of a parabola is pretty close to spherical in shape. If I just drop a sphere in here and have it kiss the parabola right at the bottom, try to anyway, my drawing's not that good, but you see the shapes are similar right at the bottom. In fact, we don't even build that much. We just build this much of it. But there are differences as you get away from the main axis. The sphere has a constant radius of curvature, and because of that constant radius of curvature, it's easier to manufacture. It doesn't really matter how you set up the piece of glass. As you're grinding it, you can put it in any direction. You have a machine that wears it down at the same radius of curvature, and so they're cheap to make. In fact, you can buy telescope kits, make your own telescope, grind your own mirror. They give you a piece of glass, and then uh, you basically just um, polish it for days on end, and then you send it off and get it coated. Anyway, they're cheaper to make, and so you see it in amateur telescopes, but as you can see from the diagram, it doesn't focus the light perfectly. It's going to be a little bit fuzzy. So to compensate for that, they put a corrector lens right on the top of the telescope. That was that plate on the front of the telescope. I'll show it again. But it deflects the light. It refracts the light, I should say, just a little bit as it's coming in. Bounces off the spherical mirror, uh, but now it's not parallel. Now the rays are coming in from slightly different directions, but it's just the right angles such that a spherical mirror will focus the light. So it's cheaper to do this. And again, there's the corrector plate right there. Now, it's common in the amateur market. You see it sometimes in the professional market. This is a Schmidt telescope, about as big as it gets. This is probably about one meter. It's the European Southern Observatory. They have a Schmidt. What these uh, telescopes are good at, they're good at giving you a large field of view without distortion. So let me explain that. The prompt telescopes, their field of view, if you're going to image a part of the sky, you're imaging just an itty bitty little piece of the sky. It's about one sixth of a degree across the prompt telescopes, and that's kind of typical of most telescopes. Some a little bit bigger, particularly if you're willing to pay the money for a large format camera. In, in a lot of science that we do, that's all you need. You know where your object is, it's just one point of light that you're studying, you point to it, you get the data you need. But another way of doing science is surveys, where you just image large, large areas of the sky, maybe the entire sky, and study what you see. Maybe if you're looking for needles in the haystack, you've got to image a large area. And decades ago, astronomers did this. We imaged the entire northern sky and the entire southern sky. But if we did it with a telescope that only had that small field of view, it would take forever. Point and <coughs> image, point and image, point and image. It would take forever to cover the whole sky. So what you want to use is a telescope that has a large field of view, like a degree or two degrees, something like this, where you know, maybe this is about a degree. If you can cover that much sky every time you point the telescope and expose, then you're going to be able to cover the whole sky much more quickly. And that's what we did back in the day. But you can't just do this with any old telescope. Most telescopes, you have good image quality in the center. You have well-defined stars, crisp um, spiral arms on galaxies. But as you get farther from the center of the image, you start to pick up some distortions. And the farther you get off the main axis of the telescope, the distortions get greater. There are all sorts of different types of distortions, but a common one is called coma. 
because kind of how it looks, it looks kind of cometary, uh, where you have a head and the legs kind of streaked out away from the main axis. And let's just take this piece of a big image here, and it will look kind of like this. Here you can see all the stars have been distorted away from the upper right. And so the center of the field of view of the telescope would be off the upper right of the image. This would be the lower left corner. And that's no good. If you're going to image the whole sky, you want it to be nice and crisp. And so a good solution for that is that a Schmidt telescope, you can have a large field of view uh, without image distortion. So I should point out here, let me just write it down. You got the amateur application and you got the professional application. And with the amateur, the reason you do it is because it's cheap. And professional, you get large field of view. Uh, without coma. Now I'll come back to the sky surveys in a little bit, but that's why we have the uh, Schmidt telescopes. This is the one that did the southern sky. There's also one that did the northern sky. There are other ones out there as well. The surveys continue to the modern day. We keep going back and doing better and better surveys, but we haven't covered the whole sky like we did decades ago. Okay. Any questions on... Telescope design. 